I mean, I really do. I love you all. Um, I, it's, I don't thank you so much for when you send those things. Um, it's always crazy humbling. Um, I've got one text thread right now that it's, it's pretty lengthy, and it's like nine prayer requests working through it, and I'm, I have a hard time. They text one. They have them numbered, and they'll text me number eight, and I have to scroll back through and find out what number eight is. And, uh, and so, but it's, it's super humbling to be able to journey alongside your friends and your family and stuff in that space. And so, um, so thank you all for letting us be a part of that. And, and do that there. And if there's anything that we can ever do, if you, if you don't have my number and you'd like to text me, things like that, um, come see me after service. More than happy to give it to you. Um, I think half of Irwin, you spend, spend enough time at the Y, half, half people in Irwin have it anyway. So, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's fine. But it, yeah, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to, uh, to text me. So, hey, real quick, if you are a first time guest, thanks for being here today. Um, when you came in, you saw a connection card in front of you. On that card is a QR code, and there's a pin there. So if you want to fill that out with a pin, you're welcome to do that. If you want to scan that QR code, you can type in that information, and that would help you just to, to kind of fill out as much information as you can. It would help us, actually, if you'd fill out as much information as you feel comfortable putting on there. Uh, and that's the way we can connect with you. If this is a place you'd like to call home, we'd love to find a way to answer any questions you might have and help you connect in to that space. If you're a regular attender and this is home for you, you and what we were just praying through of what we were doing those are ways you can share some of those things that you're going through life and what it's hit uh, and what's going on so um, you can fill that out with that same qr code or with a pin and um, if you fill it out with a pin um, you can drop it in the back box in the black box in the back or out in the hallway if you're a first-time guest we would love for you to take that to the information desk and you can give that to one of our volunteers there they would love to meet you and chat and hang out um and that would be uh, a great way for us to give you a free gift and just kind of connect in. So um, I know it's hard. Marshall's, Marshall's going to have to learn or, or something. Me and Marshall going to have to get connected here so we can do it. I love all the babies around here. It's so great. Um, but we, uh, but yeah, so, and then uh, just two other quick things. One, um, you, uh, we saw up there, I mentioned a second ago, uh, we have our kickoff next week for um, our small group kickoff. So we'll be doing breakfast in between, a little bit shorter services. Um, so it means I'm not going to be able to continue to read 45 to 60 verses on a Sunday. I'm going to have to crank this one down just a little bit tighter uh, next week. But we'll have a little bit shorter service. But we have breakfast in between. And we hang out, we spend time, and we get uh, a chance to hang out. You can connect with the group, find out what group works for you. And then we will um, let you know when sign up. So you can sign up and then groups start typically right after Labor Day with that. And then lastly, um, just thank you uh, so much for being generous. Um, we talk about tithes and giving and what happens here a lot, and the Northridge is able to do what it does because of your generosity. And so thank you um, for that. Uh, the black box in the back and out in the hallway, if you like to give in person, is still the best way to do that. Um, you can drop that in uh, before or after service. As Well, it has to be after now. If you have it with you, cannot we cannot rewind. If you can... This sermon here may take a whole different meaning in a minute. If you've got a time machine, we can go back in time and fix some stuff. But uh, we, um, but if if you're uh, if you're like most of us, you give online nrcc.church/give. You can give online there or through the church center app. So anyway, thank you all. Um, excited you're here today. So here we go. Week two, take heart. Last week we kicked off this series with a well-known um, passage, David and Goliath. And just this whole idea of just, you know, David, it's, it's a, we get this and we understand. People talk about David all the time, David and Goliath, sports teams and movies, and people love to see the underdog take out the powerhouse. I mean, it's why people hate uh, the Patriots. It's why people hate these different, you know, sports teams, Alabama right now. I mean, you know, and, and so Georgia maybe more than Bama at this point in time in life. But, uh, but that's why we hate certain sports teams. I said the Yankees earlier, and I realized they haven't won anything in forever. Nobody even cares about them. They're kind of irrelevant. But, but it's just these things of when teams get really, really powerful, sometimes people love the powerhouse, and they love that team, and they love that whole idea and that story. The Goliath is who they want to pull for. They love seeing just... Everybody else get pummeled by the big dominant Goliath. But most of us, Mike, in 1982 with the hockey team, we want to believe in miracles. We want to see David conquer Goliath. We want to see things change and happen in a way that aren't the norm. And this story with David and Goliath is such an encouraging thing because we see this whole idea and this move around David's faith. You know, David, God sent an unlikely 
you know, teenage, tiny teenager. I mean, up against this nine foot giant that is walking out here. And it just, you know, this guy, he comes out and he taunts every day for 40 days. He taunts morning and night, just telling them how wimpy they are, what they can do. But then day 41 comes. Day 41 comes and David, like I said, not able to put on the armor, can't wear the things. He walks out as a different guy, different kid, and, and steps in with faith in God believing that God can do what he says he, he would can do. And he steps into a space and changes history uh, forever, God working through him. And, and so that kind of leads to our verse that's been our theme verse for this series in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. While, you know, while we feel like having trouble is going to happen, it's these seasons that, that we get into that, that are never going to end is where things kind of get hard sometimes. Like sometimes you feel like, oh, man, hard things come, tension's there, life comes, things get hard, things get crazy. But it's when they get there and it feels like you're sitting and it's never going to end. Maybe, that, maybe even that God doesn't care is where we start to get to at times. It's when things start to get kind of to a space that's a lot harder and a lot more difficult. And that's where we're going to be navigating today. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 14. Uh, we're going to journey through this whole, um, this whole passage uh, chapter here. And so we're going to read a lot and really going to let Scripture do the work. We're going to kind of sit in that and let it kind of do its thing. And, we'll, um, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in between some of these verses. But here we go, diving in, starting in verse 1. It says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in, the, in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they, and they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So let me catch you up really quick if this story is familiar to you. So we're sitting in this space here where the Israelites are standing around and Moses and Aaron are there and they have just they have just had in the previous chapter the 12 spies go into the promised land to look at the place that they've been wanting to go forever they've been wondering for 40 years to get to this space to this moment to this time and they send these 12 spies in and they walk through for 40 days uh, and inside of this they walk through the promised land and they're journeying through this space and as they're going through, they see all these amazing things. And we'll read about some of that here in a minute. But it's just unbelievable land. It's more than they could have ever imagined. But there's some giants in there. There's some things in there that aren't just going to be easy. There's still some work to do. It's not just like we're not just walking in with an unlimited shopping cart at our favorite store. I mean, there's still, we got to go earn the money. We can go buy stuff, but we got to earn the money. We got to do the things. There's still some work to do. Once they get to the promised land, they just don't get to sit around, eat the milk and honey, and watch their favorite Hulu or Netflix show. I mean, they have work they have to do in this space. And so when they get back, ten of the spies are just absolutely against this. This is terrible. I mean, they, they even say here, I mean, they've, because the spies have already talked to them at this point in time, and they say, you know, our children and wives will be taken as plunder. And, and then they get to this, and there's two that, of course, there's two, and we'll talk about them in a second, that are saying, man, we should go, we should go, we should go. And then there's these 10 that are over here, but they're like, we should have just go, we should go back to captivity. We should go back to being slaves. And I'm just going, man, that's, that's intense. I mean, you think about where they are in their life right now, and you would have to believe that even as complicated and as hard as it's been wandering through the wilderness, that has to be better than having someone else beat you and make you work and carry and do at their pace, at their level, and what they want and what they need. You know, and, and again, I, I mean, we've all had rough days, but I can't imagine wanting to step back in to a space that's that hard, and they, and they and I don't know if they've just forgotten how hard it was, and the um, the misery immediately that they're in, they think, man, that was so much easier back then, or if they've just gotten distracted, and or if they're just so kind of childish as we see here in a minute about some things, but you know they they're on the cusp of the promised land. They send these twelve spies in and see what it's like, and now we kind of jump back in at verse five. 
It says, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. So Moses and Aaron, Aaron's his brother, um, and they fall down and they are literally just face down pleading, praying, asking the Israelites to kind of jump in and journey and kind of like understand this. Joshua, uh, son of Nun and Caleb, son of, of Jephna, um, who are the two other spies, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into, the land, into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the, glory of, then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. So Joshua and Caleb are here. They're the other two spies. They're the ones that have come in, come back and said, hey, as you can see, we can do this. We've got this. Like, God, like any blessing that the, uh, these other tribes has has been removed. God is with us. We are moving in this space. We are here. This is where we're going. And, and they kind of get to this place, and, and they're trying to convince and trying to go, and, and they're saying, you know, just don't rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid, and don't do these things. And when you think about it, you know, like uh, Joshua and Caleb, they're sitting there, and it says they tore their clothes. They, they weren't like us. They couldn't go back to their tent and have a closet full of clothes. They can just throw on something new. This is all they have. I mean, they're making an extreme statement here, it's like crying out. To the Israelites, crying out to God to speak in, to work, to do into the hearts of what they're wanting, to what the Israelites are wanting to do. And he's they're saying, please understand, please, please see more. Remember, remember what God has done. You know, they've been wondering for 40 years, and that's on top of the 40 years they were in slavery because Moses, Moses threw a temper tantrum and ran away because he murdered somebody. So they've been sitting here for 80 years now. And they're at this place, they're at this moment, they're on the cusp, and they're just going, remember what God's done. Remember the, remember the plagues that he sent to get us freed from captivity. Remember the manna from heaven as we were wandering in the desert and we needed something to eat and God would daily drop food to us so that we were taken care of, that we were cared for. I mean, and just all of these, these things, and the story is so long, parting the Red Sea, the things that God did continually, it's pretty lengthy, all of that. And they're looking at the two guys who are trying to help them to remember that, and they're going, we think putting them in the middle and all of us getting stones and chucking them at them is the best way to go. They're wanting to kill these guys because they're wanting to take a risk that they don't see as necessary. Jumping back in at verse 11, it says, The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. So God's talking to Moses. And I just, I just want to, for a minute, look at this. Like God has spent some time, really. Like Moses has got to hear from God in a way that most people do not and did not, of course, back then. I mean, if you came to him through a burning bush, we, he gets to hear, to hear him talk in, in the Ten Commandments upon Mount Sinai. I mean, he, he's got these moments here where God is continuing to speak and to, to, to have an interaction with him. And, and one of the things that I want to think about is this. How many of us would say, man, I would love to have God speak to me? I would love to have the voice of God just speak in and go. Now, there's this creepy part of it. Like if we're walking down our hallway and a voice starts coming from another room, we're like, I'm the only person in the house and this is getting weird. And so there's that eerie part of, I mean, a bush catches on fire and somebody starts talking out of it. Like, I don't care how much you're looking for God to talk to you. That's going to weird you out if all of a sudden the eye on your stove pops on and it's God just sitting there talking to you in the middle of your kitchen. You're going to be a little weirded out. And that's how we see, we kind of see this as like Dorothy and her band of misfits with the man behind the curtain. 
it's this great booming voice in God. And, and he speaks in this way that we kind of go, man, if God would just speak to me like that and I could hear the voice and I could understand and I could get to this place. And the reality is that when Jesus left to go back to heaven after he had passed away and rose again, he said, I'm leaving one with you. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to indwell you, to live inside you, a still, small voice. See, we're wanting this booming, we're wanting this loud thing, we're wanting this, this parent to kind of get loud and direct and yell in a moment when we're about to walk into something. But the reality is, if we're about to run into the street and our parent yells, yeah, that helps. But how many times in our life are we about to walk into a situation it just starts to churn. It starts to hit. Something happens in here. And we get nervous and we get uneasy and we go, man, I know I shouldn't be doing that. I know I shouldn't be stepping into that space. I know I shouldn't be leaning into that. And yet we still step in, we still go, we still do because we're ignoring the voice of God. We're ignoring the voice that we so desperately want to hear. So we do get to hear the voice. The other thing is, I think the more comfortable we are with people, the more direct we are with them. So like you think about one of your best friends when you're talking to them and you're sharing with them. Like if they say something, you're willing to go at it. You're willing to fight with them. You're willing to argue. You're willing to annoy them until you kind of maybe get them on a path and a direction and an idea that you think at least you get to understand what they're thinking. Like, you may not agree with it, but at least if you can pester and annoy them enough and you can ask enough questions, you get there. And Moses has an unbelievable relationship with God because we're going to dive in right here because most of us, if we're talking to God, if we knew we were God, if God was walking in the room and we knew we were talking to God, a lot like if we were talking to someone who was, was royalty or some, you know, the president or a, a, a big leader in our community or maybe somebody who owns a business or a sports team or something that we really respect, maybe our favorite player. We wouldn't go to them and start trying to go, hey, I noticed your bat's dipping a little bit in your swing. We would be going, hey, like, I, man, I'm so humbled to be sitting here. If you could have dinner with anybody who would, oh, my goodness, you're not going to sit there and question them about, like, how their shot was 40 years ago. You're going to want to have a conversation around. You want to talk, you want to hear, you're going to want them to invest in you. And Moses is talking to God. I mean, God the creator. And he jumps in and he says this as he dives in and back in at first, verse 13. And he says, Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land, of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you, pull, if you put all of these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land. He promises them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for their sin, for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. So Moses even says there at the end, you've given them a chance, you've given them chance after chance. You've shown mercy, and I'm asking you to do it again. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever sat in a place where you're going, I know what I deserve. I know what people deserve. I know what my kid deserves. I know what I deserve. I know what this is. I know what this. But God, I'm asking you. Because here you did this, and here you did this, and here you did this. We sing songs. I, you know, I've seen you move the mountain. I believe you can do it again. You made a way when there was no way. I believe you can do it again. God, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. And I believe you can do it again. And Moses is in this moment and in this space. And he's saying, God, do it again. We've seen you work. We've seen you show mercy. 
be that God one more time. And here's what God says to him. Jumping back in at verse 20. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. God's response, done. Forgiven. But there's still consequences. Forgiveness is available, but the consequence of sin, the consequence of our actions, still has to be dealt with. God jumps back in, starting in verse 26, and says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter, enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb and Joshua. As for your children that you, that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will surely do these things to, to this whole wicked community, which is band together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here they will die. In this moment, in this space, this is the place where this starts to get a little uncomfortable. Because what we want to look at is we want to see God come in and we just want to say, okay, forgiveness and, and everything's going to be okay and we'll pat him on the back and let's just move him through. But in our lives, we have consequences. In our lives, when we make decisions, we don't get to just go back to normal all the time. We don't just get to move along and go and do. There are things that we have to sit in and deal with. And God's saying, all of you that's grumbled, all of you all that I've offered and I've done and I've given and all you've done is complain and complain and wish you were dead, that's what's going to happen. And because of your sin, because of how this sits, I'm actually, your kids are going to have to stay here and shepherd the land until all of you die, until all of this goes. And sometimes we forget about the fact that our actions don't just affect us. They affect the people around us. The consequence may just at times affect us. I was sharing with my boys this week. We've all heard Proverbs 13. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. When you're hanging out with a fool, it doesn't mean you'll become a fool, but it does mean you face the same consequences and the same outcomes sometimes that they do, even if you're not a fool. When we sit in a place and in a moment, we face sometimes the repercussions of the people around us. And we need to remember, as parents and grandparents and leaders and just adults that are bringing kids along, everybody wants to talk about how hard kids have it. And the question maybe we should ask is, how are we helping? What are we doing? How are we coming along? How are we coming alongside them? How are we caring for them? 
what, mo- what example are we setting? Or are we making choices and actions and stuff that have such deep consequences that they're going to continue to pay for the life that we've lived? Jumping back in at verse 36. So the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua and Caleb survived. They went for 40 days. Spent 40 days walking through the promised land. All the amazing stuff that was there. And only two of those 12 were permitted to move in. The reality comes down to this. We have to take some ownership of our choices. It's through us accepting punishment. It's through us confessing to come to grips with the fact that there may be some hard days that we can start to realign with God's plan for our next step. Let me um, wrap up the rest of these verses here. When Moses reported this to the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they set out uh, for the highest point in the hill, hill country, saying, now we're ready to go up to the land the Lord promised. Surely, surely we have sinned. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not, this will not succeed. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies for the Amalekites and the Canaanites will face you there because you have turned away from the Lord. He will not be with you and you will not, and, and you will fall by the sword. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill, in the hill country. Through, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp, then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill in that hill country came down, attacked them, and beat them down all the way to Hamath. You ever been there? You ever been in a space where you're like, okay, I know what the answer is. I know that mom and dad said this is the punishment and this is what it's going to be, but I'm just going to run up that hill one more time and I'm going to see if I can convince them. I know what happened at work. I know what my friends and family said. I know what happened in this space, but I'm going to give it one more shot. And I'd say most of us have. Hey, I know I messed up. I know I sinned. I mean, they're, they're even like, now, now they're at the point like, okay, we get it, God. We sinned. We did it. We messed up. And I don't know if there's a heart change. I know there's fear. I know there's worry. I know there's a nervousness about the fact that they're like, we're right there. God, we're so close. How can that decision stop us from entering in? How can that decision stop us from chasing our dreams? How can that decision stop us from entering to what we've been promised? And the reality is we all sit there. We all sit in that space. There's consequences for our actions. And there's seasons of pain because of our decisions. And occasionally we make decisions that stick with us forever. You might have a car accident that's just a really bad accident that your insurance or no insurance will ever forgive you for, and it goes up, and and you just have to pay that fee the rest of your life. And then maybe you make a relational decision that ends a marriage or a friendship, and those aren't things you can just heal. We don't always get to just move on from our decisions. That doesn't mean that God's done with us. It may look a little different. And it may take a little longer. But there's still a promised land out there for you. There's still a promised land out there for me. There is a space that God is still wanting to work and do in your life. And as the band's coming back up, I just want to read you... um, something a pastor that I I follow and and respect his name's Craig Rochelle and you might have read some of his books or seen his sermons and things he posted on um, on Instagram this past week I just want to read you this post and so if if you want to go in and really read these words and stuff his name's Craig Rochelle he's pretty easy to find he leads the largest church in the country so he's not hard to get to and um, he just says this 
He says, if you feel like life is in a valley right now, I want to remind you of a few spiritual truths that may help you build your faith to continue. In Psalm 23, David said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Remember, you may be in the valley, but you're not alone. God is with you. And no matter how permanent the valley may feel, the valley is not your home. You're walking through it with God as your guide. He will help you get to the other side. I know it may feel dark, but something good can come from it. God never says you won't go through the valley. But he does say, you never have to go through them alone. What I wish in my life and like every parent, we have all at some point in time prayed the safety prayer. God, keep our kids safe. God, do. And, and I think there is a level of God, direct our kids, help our path, help their path when we run towards you. But easy and safe isn't something that God promised us. He promised us his presence. And he promised us to be faithful. The Israelites, and this is a really hard chapter to swallow because we're looking at thousands and thousands of people. I mean, there's literally 10 people that God wiped out in an instant. And that's, we want gracious God. We want loving God. We don't want vengeful, angry God. But friends, I wish that it didn't. But my actions have, have consequences. Your actions have consequences. We have to understand that in a moment in a space, whatever our dream is, whatever the calling is, we can actually do things that stop us from getting there. The beauty of God, the beauty of His redemptive ability. It's that he's not done with you in that moment. But it takes us, takes me, it takes you being willing to address and confess and deal with the junk and the pain and the sin and the, the hurt and the muck that's in our life. And on the other side of that, there's still a promised land. It may not be the same thing. You may have to adjust to what God opens for you. You may have to lean in to something that God's doing that's a little bit different. But I promise you, if you're willing to lean into what He is wanting to do in your life in this moment, if you're willing to lean in to the, to the, to the place that He's leading, the place that He's directing, the place that He's sending, there is as beautiful of a hope. There is as much opportunity for you there is as much joy for you. There is as much excitement for you. There is much opportunity to see life change happen, for you to influence people for the kingdom as there ever was. But it takes us being willing to confess, to own up, and to know that God is there and that He is faithful. And even though it may feel hard and it may feel dark, and we may feel like it's impossible that we're not alone. So God, thank you. Thank you that, that when it seems 